Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's Swerf Buffy Bocconi e-lecture. We are very pleased that Katrin Affenmacher from the ECB has kindly agreed to present on Libra and its implications for monetary policy and for financial supervision and financial stability. Dirk Niepert from the University of Bern joined us today to discuss Katrin's remarks. The meeting will be moderated by Donato Marchandaro, director from the Buffy Kerfen Center, the Copenhagen University, and uh, also a member of the Swerf Council of Management. My talk uh, is about the Libra, the Libra uh, Second Zero, and what it means for monetary policy and for security. These views here are my own, and they are not necessarily the views of, of the ECU. Mm. Recently, the monetary system has changed quite a bit, and in particular, the new thing that has arrived as a financial innovation is crypto assets. Assets that are not governed by a monetary authority, but they are governed either by an algorithm or, or a private entity, a private firm, mostly big tech, tech firm. And the adoption of these crypto assets has raised a lot of concerns related to money laundering to illicit financing, as well as to consumer and investor protection. So this relates, of course, to the uh, first generation um, crypto assets, mainly Bitcoin, but also stable coins, such as the Libra initiative uh, by Facebook, has sparked quite a lot of reactions among regulators and policy makers. There have been a lot of efforts to better understand the implications of such uh, privately issued stable coins. Of course, the extent of adoption is key for the implications related to monetary policy. So Bitcoin has been around for uh, some 10 years now, and it has never raised as many concerns as Libra because uh, the adoption has been fairly limited. And this could um, change with Libra, and I will explain why. Financial stability issues don't necessarily rely only on the extent of adoption. They mostly rely on the um, links with the banking and the financial system. Also, that has been to date been relatively limited for existing crypto assets, but of course this can quickly change. I will first say something about global stable coins and the Libra initiative by Facebook, and then um, explain the potential implications for financial stability and monetary policy. The global stable coin. To uh, recall what a global stable coin is, it is a digital asset that features a mechanism that is intended to reduce price volatility, and the global stable coin is a stable coin with global reach. So there are coins that are not so stable, so the algorithmic coins like Bitcoin that typically are very volatile, and most existing stable coins, like for example FIFA, they have at the moment not a global reach. Um, the stable coin is typically issued on a distributed ledger. Uh, meaning that there is no central authority um, governing the transactions between the stable coins. So it can be a blockchain or something similar. And the value of the stable coin is collateralized by funds that back up the issue of commitment to redeeming them. So Bitcoin is truly algorithmic, but in stable coins, there is an issuer, an identifiable issuer, and there is a value behind the coin, meaning that when you acquire a global stable coin, you pay into an app and a reserve, and this reserve is invested to back up the value of the stable coin. Existing stable coins nowadays have very limited links to traditional financial systems. They are typically used to move between crypto asset investments because they are also tokenized, so they are also issued on a blockchain, and so therefore can seamlessly uh, administer trades that uh, are in more speculative crypto assets, and they are more stable, so they're better suited to store revenue. So that's currently the main uh, topic for the main use for, for stable coins. So this ecosystem has been shaken up with the announcement of Libra. So in June 2019, Facebook issued a white paper where uh, it announced Libra as a global stable coin and as a financial infrastructure. And uh, Libra is built on a blockchain technology, so it's issued as a token. 
It uh, should be backed by a reserve of stable and liquid assets that are denominated in international currency. So, and um, following a parliamentary request, the Libra Association details that it will be invested to 50% in US dollar, around 18% in euro, and then the rest in yen, the British pound, and the Singapore dollar. It will be governed by an independent institution that is um, incorporated in, in Switzerland and it can be converted into a local currency based on an exchange rate. So Libra will be back, so the original purpose of um, proposal of Libra uh, did foresee a backing of a basket of uh, currencies, so you cannot convert Libra back into kind of basket, but you can convert it back into the currency you would like to have and then of course you as a user of Libra, you entail an exchange rate risk because all these uh, currencies have different exchange rates. So this proposal sparked a lot of reactions from the official sector. So the G7 issued a report on global stablecoins already in October. And in this report, the G7 acknowledged that there is a need for innovation, in particular in um, uh, cross-border payments where markets are not necessarily very competitive, where it takes very long and is very expensive. There is also a use case for stable coins in financial inclusion. So you can uh, have a stable coin even if you don't have a bank account. So therefore, people that are unbanked could potentially benefit from, from, from stable coins. However, there are potentially adverse effects on the transmission of monetary policy. There are risks for financial stability and it will profoundly change the international monetary system. And as an upshot, as a conclusion of this report, the G7 requested that uh, same activities and same risks should face same regulation. So simply the fact that now a tech company that's um, uh, issuing a currency should not mean that it is less um, strongly regulated than uh, payment services provider or bank. At the same time, public authorities committed to continue improving uh, existing payment systems to make them cheaper and faster. And um, it also sparked uh, renewed interest and a lot of research on the central bank side into issuing central bank digital currency. So there is a survey from the BIS that uh, was first done in 2019, where there were only very few central banks active in looking into uh, central bank digital currencies, and it was repeated this year, and the share of central banks investigating this topic has increased quite, quite drastically. Going to regulation, a stable coin could fall under a number of different regulatory frameworks, or potentially none of them. And I think this fact, to some extent, explains the nervousness that uh, regulators felt when Libra came up as a proposal. So, Libra entails some payment functions and these payment functions, so I'm not talking for the Euro system, but of course other jurisdictions will have similar issues. So for the Euro system, it would fall under the oversight framework if the payment system is located in the Euro area, which in the case of Libra it will not be because it's uh, located in Switzerland, or if it becomes systemically relevant for Euro payments. This could very quickly become the case, so if there's widespread spread adoption, it would become systemically relevant and um, uh, looking at plausible take ups so it would be under the regulation as a payment system. If it's not systemically relevant, it would not be regulated by the US. The asset management function, meaning the administration of the reserve, could qualify as an issue of e-money, as an investment fund, or as a bank, or nothing of that. So if the claim on the stable coin is redeemable as par, and there is a claim on the issuer and this uh, entity does not issue credit, then this would be e-money. If an acquirer of a stable coin has a claim on the share of this issuer's assets, then it would be an investment fund. And if it's um, redeemable at par and there is provision of credit, then it would be a bank. So and now if you put these things together, then it turns out that the stable coin arrangement that is uh, incorporated outside the euro area and not systemically relevant without a claim on the issuer or a claim on the reserve assets 
which is what uh, Libra is doing. So if you acquire Libra, you, you don't get a claim on uh, the Libra Association and you don't get a claim on the share of the reserve assets, then none of these regulations will, will apply to the sale of bonds. So there is clearly, there can be a gap in, in regulating the bonds. So in response to these concerns, Libra then um, issued a second white paper in April this year. And the new thing is that there is um, single currency stable coins. So in addition to the basket, there will be a dollar stable coin and a euro stable coin. There is a stronger protection for the reserve. For example, there's a capital buffer to um, accommodate um, the fluctuations in the value of the assets in the reserve. There will be a permission blockchain system only, so this is a response to uh, safety concerns with an open blockchain. And there will be an enhanced compliance framework for the prevention of illicit activity, so illicit um, financing and um, money laundering done with this stuff. This new white paper also uh, envisages potential future touch points with central banks. So either Libra uh, would like to put part of the reserve in the central bank account, or it would like to function as a distribution agent for central bank digital currencies when and if these become available. However, the concerns related to public policies that I outlined before, they continue to persist also with these updated white papers. So now going a bit more into detail with, uh, onto the implications for financial stability and for monetary policy. So first, we need to get a gauge on how much uh, take-up there could be in, in Libra. And here I'm now drawing on an article that has been, that has been published in the ECB Microprudential Bulletin in May, which still refers to the um, uh, first Libra proposal, but um, as there is no explicit um, taking into account of this multi-currency setup, it's still valid also for, for the single currency Libra. And this um, article uh, compares uh, potential Libra take up to some benchmark figures for existing payment systems. So one is PayPal. So there are 286 million PayPal users around the world and they hold about uh, 46 euros per capita. But maybe this is something that's a little bit too low because uh, PayPal allows you to also draw on your credit card. So you probably hold less of in your PayPal account than you would probably hold with Libra when you cannot easily connect to, to your bank account. Another um, comparison is Yubao. So this is a part of the Alibaba group, um, a payment system in China that has 588 million users and they hold um, yeah, about 230 euro per capita. So this is converted uh, at market exchange rate. So maybe it's um, exaggerating a little bit, but um, uh, it's significantly more than uh, the balance on a typical PayPal account. So this already gives us a little bit of an indication um, of, of um, yeah, goalposts uh, that uh, potential take-up could um, um, result for Libra. Facebook has 2.4 billion users, so far exceeding these two to other payment schemes. And about 10% of these uh, users are uh, located in the euro area. So if you look at uh, what could result from these figures, it turns out that Libra could be one of the largest money market funds in, in Europe. So the euro share in Libra exceeds the share of euro area Facebook users. So uh, Libra will have 18% euro, but uh, only 10% Facebook users in, in, in the euro area. So this already can indicate that um, there is potentially an inflow of funds into the euro area because there will be more people taking up uh, Libra in other parts of the world than in the euro area. Up to 30% of euro area shared, shared assets could end up in the Libra reserve that um, announced that it will invest about 80% into uh, state government bonds which is a significant share of, of the euro area um, short-term government bond market. By contrast, on bank deposits, um, which is often cited as a big concern, the um, figures are less dramatic. 
So um, with the larger take up, the outflow of household deposits from the banking sector into Libra would be less than 3%. And the bank deposits, so Libra plans to invest 20% of the reserve into bank deposits. The bank deposits managed by Libra by the Libra Reserve would be about 0.5%. Of course, all these figures are surrounded by a big uncertainty. So these are just scenarios to give kind of uh, ballpark figures. But of course, the actual take up either in the euro area or abroad could be vastly different. So what would this mean for financial stability? First, um, as a user of a stable coin, the reserve is exposed to banks' credit risk and liquidity risk, and at the same time to credit, liquidity, and market risk of the government bonds. So if you use a stable coin, it's probably it's only as stable as uh, the reserve behind it, and this reserve is um, subject to this risk. In addition, the risk uh, depend on whether the value of the coin is fixed. So users may misperceive the risk of the floating value. It is clear that uh, you, for the multi-currency Libra, you, you face exchange rate risk. For the single currency coins, um, users may even more perceive this as a stable nominal value and be not aware of the risk. If there is a fixed value, then of course this creates a solvency risk for the issuer. So in the moment where trust into the reserve uh, evaporates, there could be big sell-offs with run and with ensuing contagion. And the problem here with the updated uh, proposal is that uh, the single currency stable points are not legally separated. So if there is an issue arising in one part of the reserve, say with the Singapore dollar or the yen, this could spill over into the euro reserve or into the um, dollar reserve. So there is cross-currency contagion possible. For monetary policy, Libra um, uh, announced that they will have a zero um, nominal interest rate. And this zero remuneration of Libra could harden the effective lower bound of policy rates. So your area rates now are half a percentage point below zero. Users, uh, bank deposit holders are not currently mostly not experiencing this um, negative interest rate. But of course, uh, if Libra guarantees a, neg a zero interest rate, uh, it could be uh, attractive to users. However, the reserve would not be able to evade the negative interest rate environment completely. So if Libra guarantees a zero rate for the users that um, has to invest into negative yielding assets, the business model to some extent is at risk. And the question is, um, where will the money come from to guarantee a zero uh, interest rate on Libra? And one potential source could be fees, but again, users may not fully really be aware of the fees they are paying on Libra by converting into Libra or paying with Libra. And um, the setup that is envisaged with a zero interest rate on Libra and uh, uh, the association earning a benefit on the investment of the reserve might not be viable in, in the negative interest rate uh, environment. The Libra reserve, as I said already, um, plausible scenarios are that uh, it could take up about 30% of the assets rated A or higher. This could contribute to asset scarcity. As a scarcity has uh, already shown that uh, it can create problems for monetary policy. One problem is that the risk-free yield curve can, uh, will be lowered. It can increase money market fragmentation and uh, it will affect collateral quality and valuation about different member states. So if uh, scarce assets become even scarcer, banks and other participants in monetary policy operation would be tempted to um, submit lower collateral quality to this operation. So it could also result in collateral scarcity and, and lower quality. One issue that's often mentioned is that um, there could be a move from bank deposits into Libra. And it's not clear at which uh, scale. So I personally believe that the scale won't be very big, but um, of course it can be different. If there is a significant shift of deposits into Libra, this would uh, affect deposit funds. So deposits are typically a low, low cost funding for, for, for banks. Banks would have to replace deposits by other 
types of funding, be it from the central bank or be it from the wholesale market. On the other hand, uh, the Libra Reserve will also invest uh, into bank deposits. And there possibly could also be an inflow from outside the euro area. So banks could have an inflow from this uh, investment, but this would be a wholesale investor. So it would be more price sensitive than retail investors, and it would probably also be more flighty than retail deposits. So could not qualify as uh, such um, stable and cheap uh, funding source like retail uh, deposits. If Libra was backed by um, central bank reserves, this could of, be, of course be perceived as a very safe um, means of payment and the outflow of deposits could uh, even be even larger and then no reinvestments would result. Bank disintermediation could have consequences for lending rates and credit provision. So if um, bank funding becomes more expensive, then uh, probably credit would also become more expensive. And um, if banks decide to shrink their balance sheets, also the, the quantity of uh, credit could uh, become smaller. Um, if Libra was used in payments uh, to a significant extent, of course, banks the income from payments could also be affected. This is not to say that this is a bad thing. This is mostly to say that um, things could change and monetary policy transmission in the euro area is very bank dependent. So changes in the structure of the banking system would of course have to be monitored and uh, would change uh, monetary policy. Other effects for monetary policy, Libra could induce capital inflows that uh, affect the exchange rate. Um, this is particularly true for, for multi-currency version of Libra that has a higher share invested in Euro than uh, the share of potential users in the Euro area. And the effect of the single currency version of Libra depends on take up abroad. But there I would expect that the Expect US, the US um, the version of Libra version is the US dollar version is more attractive than the Euro version because also nowadays people decide to go into dollar and less into Euro. If prices were to be quoted in multi-currency Libra, the unit of account function uh, of uh, money could be uh, become impaired, and this also would affect monetary policy transmission. And finally, if Libra was used in payments to a significant extent, bank demand for for clearing uh, payments and thus the demand for central bank reserves could decrease. This could have implications for the operation of the corridor system for short term rates, but this is something that would only become relevant in the very long term as currently, as you know, um, rates are at the floor of the corridor and uh, not um, to, uh, yeah, it's not um, envisaged that they, they, they will um, return to a cor uh, corridor system is something that might happen only uh, very far into the so let me conclude. So Libra can fill gaps in cross-border uh, payments that are currently slow and expensive and fail to satisfy demand in terms of convenient cost access. On the other hand, global stablecoins such as Libra could interfere with monetary policy transmission via different channels. And the concerns related to monetary policy and financial stability and regulation are not alleviated by the updated Libra proposal. Under plausible scenarios for adoption, the monetary policy impact would be quite contained, but um, unknowns remain. And uh, I think what can be said for sure is that the Libra initiative has acted as a catalyst to advance work on central bank digital currency, which previously has been something that only very few countries were looking at uh, in detail, but now it's uh, research and that has become much more widespread. So, and I stop here. So. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much um, for inviting me, having me, and uh, discuss Katrin's um, views about Libra. And I think I'm going to be a bit of a boring discussion uh, to the extent that um, we mostly agree. So basically, this is a short version of my discussion. I think Katrin and myself, we agree very much Whatever she said, I, I more or less agree with. I think she made her points uh, very um, convincing. Um, I would like to start with um, the last point that she made. 
So, Katrin finished uh, with the remark that Libra uh, can act as a catalyst for CBDC. And I, I very much agree on that one. And that's sort of the angle that I would like to make a few comments here and add to the points that Katrin has made. About a year ago, I wrote something on Vox EU, which, which basically had the punchline, the same punchline that um, what Libra and many of the other initiatives really do is that they take the status quo off the table now. The banking system, the financial sector as we know it, and the environment in which central banks intervene and conduct monetary policy is no longer the one that, that uh, they have gotten used to. So even if Libra or its next best replica will not be the big game changers that some people might think they would be, they will certainly have a big impact in the sense of forcing central banks, I think, to move much faster in the direction of um, introducing central bank digital currency. I think this is something that we do see in the data. Katrin alluded to something similar to that. This is a, this is a recent publication by the BIS where people have collected apparently speeches by uh, central bank representatives and you see here that in the early, uh, in the early time of uh, the discussion around in CBDC, 16, 17, 18, there was much, much um, pessimism and skepticism among central bankers. There was a bit of an uptick in the middle of 18, and then there came Libra in the mid-2019, in June 2019. And when you basically just read the BIS announcements, if you looked at what, um, what the governor of the BIS and many other central bank governors were saying and writing, you noticed a stark change in the tone. Uh, there is now much more openness, at least that's my perception, towards central bank digital currency much more openness to engage in the discussion and uh, much more openness to uh, actually willing, uh, get much more willingness also to act in that direction rather than just to claim that central bank digital currency uh, is a disaster and that we should try to stop it as good as we can. So I think this is a, a, a big role that Libra and France has already played and will continue to play in the future. Let me make a few comments on the intersection between technology, economics, and regulation that Katrin talked about. And then I will also have one or two comments on financial stability and monetary policy. So first on, on this intersection between technology, economics, regulation, which I think is, is the interesting intersection between uh, that, that we observe these days when we think about FinTech, Big Tech, um, Libra as a part of that, but also central bank digital currency. And I think that um, although one of the main factors that, that really draws the public interest to all these discussions is technology, I think in the end technology is sort of second order, at least if you are coming from my direction, my background as an economist and not probably understanding really all the intricacy of the technology, whether this is DLT, whether this is um, you know, regulated by a central party or distributed, etc. This might all, at the margin, contribute to higher efficiency in payments, in settlement, et cetera. But I think this is just part of the long-term trends of the, of the long-term improvements in efficiency in the financial sector. I think what is really first order due to the changes that we observe here by the entrance of FinTech, Big Tech, and also the developments in central bank digital currency is the potential implications for the, for the architecture of the financial system both on the competition side, so if you want on the, on, the, um, uh, well, on the market structure, but also more generally in financial structure, financial architecture, our layered system of uh, our layered monetary system, that these new initiatives are potentially challenging. I think this is especially true for CBDC, which I like to think of as reserves for all, so a, a, an opening up of the access to reserves. But the same is true, I think, um, uh, for initiatives like, like Libra and other big tech and fintech initiatives. You might say, well, is this really such a big change anymore since uh, we are essentially moving to a narrow banking sector system anyway? If you look at the money multiplier that we have in recent years, it has fallen dramatically in most monetary areas. It has fallen around one or below one actually in, in some monetary areas. So in some sense, the monetary architecture has already changed dramatically since the financial crisis 10 years ago, but um, maybe there's more to come in that direction. Or maybe there's a more 
or more solid structure supporting this new financial architecture coming in the, in the future. Katrin has, has uh, I found that very interesting, uh, as she highlighted the different um, dimension at which regulatory action can intervene here uh, as uh, this Libra and other initiatives. The questions that have to be answered, is this e-money, is this a fund solution, is this a bank, is it systemic or not? Um, she has talked about uh, the approach that regulators want to take here. I think a very meaningful, sensible, convincing approach, namely to say we don't want to regulate these different actors in any way differently than the old actors. We want to regulate commensurate with activities and risks. But the issue is, I guess, that some of these new players really introduce new activities which are hard to map into these old different baskets or different pools or different um, different um, yeah, different baskets that we know in the past, and also that the intersection between these different baskets are now um, relevant in different dimensions. What used to be clearly a risk management issue or a privacy issue or a um, you know customer protection uh, issue or know your customer issue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, Many of these issues now seem to be harder to disentangle, which implies that there's new challenges for regulators in the sense that they have to collaborate across regulatory um, borders in different ways as they used to have that in the past. And I fully agree with Katrin. She said these new, new, new challenges for regulators might be a huge, um, play, might play a huge part uh, as an explanatory force for why there's this, 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 this skepticism as opposed to openness when it comes to Libra and other initiatives. Financial stability, um, Katrin also alluded to that part, there is a, a very frequently voiced concern when it comes to these new forms of money that we uh, see as uh, money being issued by Libra or money being issued by other uh, new players in that, in that sphere, uh, a frequently voiced concern that these new forms of money would in the end to some extent cut off bank funding or reduce bank funding thereby lead to reduce bank lending maybe foster bank runs and all in all undermine financial stability this is a very frequently voiced concern i think it is particularly frequently voiced when it comes to the discussion around central bank digital currency and i think it's it's very important to question that concern and to think about what it really reflects and what the underlying um, a priori assumptions are and here's where i want to show this little um, this little figure uh, the three balance sheets so this is a figure that is supposed to make a case uh, or to make to to exemplify the the workings of central bank digital currency but you can think about Libra in very similar ways. So, so this is supposed to be the balance sheet of a bank, the banking sector, say. This is the balance sheet of the central bank or the government sector, consolidated government sector, including the central bank. And this is the balance sheet of the private of households, say. And when we think about, uh, let, me think, let me talk about CBDC, when we think about the introduction of central bank digital currency, then this would most likely, when households take up at least some of that stuff, would lead to a reduction in households holding of deposits so they would hold fewer deposits than before and they would hold more central bank issued money as before and this money would include cash but now also central bank digital currency and uh, what people are very concerned about is that well you know if households hold fewer deposits that means that the banks on the other side get less deposit funding so their balance sheet has to shrink or something else has to give. They cannot continue with the business model as usual. That creates a lot of concerns. Now, I think where this argument falls short is that you also have to think about what happens to the central bank's balance sheet. I'm not trying to make a deep point here. I'm just making a very basic point, but I think an important point. And that point is that to the extent that households hold more central bank issued money, the central bank receives more funding. This is an automatic, this is, this, is a, this is an accounting identity. So this has to go up at the same time. And that implies that the central bank necessarily also has to invest more into, into additional assets or it you know, shreds some other liabilities. But to the extent that it invests in other assets, the big question really is what are these new assets here? What is this additional assets that the central banks invest their new sources of funding in? And in principle, it is always possible for the central bank to re-channel those assets 
back into the banking sector. So you can, in principle, always think about this additional central bank digital currency being issued and held by households to indirectly refund banks. So in the end, if the central bank wants to do that, the central bank can basically just pass through these central bank digital currency funds back into the banking sector. So that means, and this is something that you can make much more pre uh, precise and much more general, which, which Markus Brunemeyer and I have done in a, in a paper last year in JME, you can show that under very, very general conditions, the central bank can, if it wants to, and that's of course a big caveat, if it wants to, the central bank always can insulate the banking sector from something like CBDC and much more generally, it can essentially insulate the whole investment policy by the banking sector, the real economy by central bank uh, digital currency. So if the central bank can, sorry, if the central bank wants to, it can insulate the economy from something like CBDC. Does it want that? Maybe not, but it can do so. And that implies as a logical necessity that the central bank can in principle even do better than just preserving the status quo. With Libra and other initiatives, things like this might in principle be possible, but it is much, much harder to implement that because you need this additional player, Libra, to play along. In my view, this is going to be one of the major factors that will push central banks to introduce central bank digital currency. So be, again, the argument being that as an issuer of CBDC, the central bank can to a large, large extent control how the banking sector will be able to um, receive uh, refinancing after the introduction of such new types of money. While with Libra and Co, it would be harder for the government sector to make sure that the banking sector receives an appropriate and, and similar amount of funding as before. So the big question really is, and that comes to that point here, whether with Libra, etc., it would be harder to, uh, to attain something like this neutrality or not. The big question really is, in terms of financial stability, what is the Libra reserve going to be invested in? I understand that we, we sort of know the pronouncements of what Libra Reserve is, is planning to do. It's of course a different question what will actually happen. Is the Libra Reserve going to be invested in deposits mostly in the banking sector? Then the whole discussion about you know uh, bank financing being interrupted is a no-starter anyway because banks would just be refinanced through Libra. Um, or is Libra going to engage in something like maturity transformation, so we will have another layer on top of fractional reserve banking in the system, which might of course be um, you know, triggering some concerns and financial stability matters. Or, and this is the big alternative, is the Libra reserve mostly or even fully going to be invested in reserves. And in that case, we would essentially be in a world in which we have a Facebook stablecoin, a Facebook synthetic CBDC, and then uh, you know, also in that scenario, I think governments and central banks will carefully think about whether they would like to have CBDC essentially issued by Libra or whether they want to do this. Yes. One more slide and then I will stop. This is on monetary policy. Um, I think Katrin uh, made the point again very convincingly that for major currencies, we should expect money demand to be rather stable because the Libra reserve will be invested in those currencies. Katrin mentioned that um, maybe it will be even a bit stronger money demand in the euro area and maybe as a consequence a bit weaker for the US dollar. Um, I think this will be uh, very much followed with great interest, uh, political interest on both sides of the Atlantic and also in other in also, uh, currency areas. It will be a, a major issue whether the, the global uh, composition of money demand will be shifted as a consequence of initiatives like Libra. I think it will be even more important, much more important for emerging economies, those economies whose currencies will not be held by uh, the, the Libra reserve will not be invested in. For those countries, there will be to some extent a danger of um, what people in the international finance literature have called dollarization. So the phenomenon that in some countries um, the private sector prefers to hold dollars or euros or other international currency rather than the domestic currency. The same, phenom the same phenomenon might happen in, in, in emerging economies as a consequence of Libra or similar initiatives. 
The consequence for the citizens in those emerging economies would be mostly beneficial, at least in the direct interaction they have with the financial sector. There will be more financial inclusion as a consequence, something that we typically think of as something that we like, something positive. But um, the mirror image of that will be less potential for the financial sector and the government to exercise financial repression, uh, less um, power that the government can exert on, on its citizens through that channel, less senior rich revenue for the government through that channel, simply because there's less money demand uh, for the local currency. This, again, I would think is going to be a major factor pushing for central banks to adopt central bank digital currency, um, maybe more so in emerging economies than in, uh, in established um, high income economies. Um, because simply those countries, you know, will have to fight for their money demand, for their local money demands, and the governments always have an interest to control the currency that uh, their citizenship uses, and CBDC might be one way to make the local currency more attractive. Now, many countries currently are thinking about CBDCs. Many countries are in that class of emerging market economies, and as a consequence, I think also the high-income countries will be pushed towards thinking more seriously about introducing CBDC. So for both reasons, for monetary policy reasons and financial stability reasons, I think there are good reasons to expect that CBDC will, be, will uh, continue to be on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the agenda for central banks. And I would not be surprised to see CBDCs being adopted also in high-income economies within the next 10 years. Thank you very much. And uh, Donato, thank you very much for pointing to this book, which um, I would like to advertise here. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot for this nice discussion. And as you say, I don't really disagree with you. So I think we are aligned on, on many of these topics. Where I probably have a little bit different view is on your argument with the central bank balance sheet and the balance sheet of the banking sector. So first, I don't think it's would make a difference whether the substitution uh, from bank deposits is induced by Libra or by uh, central bank digital currency, because um, the central bank would, so typically the central bank um, gives funding against collateral. And um, if the bank lends to, um, for house purchase or whatever, they would have to, so they cannot give the 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 um, the, the credit directly pass on to, pass it on to the central bank. So typically, the central bank takes government bonds as collateral or uh, some some paper or so, and a bank does a lot of lending that's not um, uh, securitized. So so there is a problem. This is a problem in the short run. I fully agree that in the long run, um, financial structure can change and we had to change to more securitization and more capital markets after the financial crisis. This will go on, but of course in the short run, it can create financial stability issues. And um, I don't see a difference between uh, Libra and um, central bank digital currency because the banks can still collateralize uh, and securitize the asset side and give it to the central bank for funding no matter what induces the substitution on the liability side. So I think that's one issue where I uh, don't have fully the same view as you. And the other thing, of course, is um, sometimes it hurt, yeah, sounded a little bit like uh, central banks will introduce digital currency relatively soon. So what I was saying is central banks have intensified work on digital currency. Uh, in the last year uh, enormously. So this is not to say that they are about to issue, at least not um, in, in developed economies, but the interest and the research that's going into the topic has, has increased quite a bit. Can I just uh, respond to the collateral argument for a second? Because I think it's a very good point and one that is um, uh, that, that, that we have thought about um, a lot, Marcus and myself. and. Um, it is, so it is true that um, we would be very surprised to see central banks right now um, funding uh, commercial banks to a large extent without collateral in the same extent. But then you have to think about what does it mean in the current system when we, when we argue that we have lenders of last resort uh, in the form of central banks. 
So when we, re when we truly believe in the land of last resort support of central banks and the current monetary system, then you have to believe in um, a central bank funding being extended to commercial banks without collateral, at least in some situations, right? And maybe only partly, maybe not the whole balance sheet, but there would be some land of last resort support uh, being extended uh, subject to reduced collateral requirements um, as uh, in the ones that we have now formally adopted. And exactly to the same extent, a CBDC would work and could work. So exactly to the same extent that um, central banks provide this land of last resort support under some conditions, uh, with central bank digital currency, the same thing would happen. The only difference would be that this implicit arrangement that we have in the current monetary system would become explicit in CBDC. Other than that, nothing would have to change. Now, if you take the position that there is no land of last resort support whatsoever in the current monetary architecture, except there is sufficient collateral being provided, then we clearly live in a schizophrenic world because this is not the world that most financial market participants believe they live in. It's certainly not the world that most cash users and bank customers uh, believe they live in. So either we live in this sort of schizophrenic world in which we, you know, cheat ourselves and then there is a pre we pretend that there is a central bank in the background providing this support or we live in a world in which this is um, not the case and then I agree then there would be it would be hard to generate equivalence between the two scenarios the CBDC and the current scenario. So first on the lender of last resort I think a key function of the lender or a key feature of lender of last resort is that it's temporary. So just to, to mention that, but I won't go into more detail that. There was a question on the uh, regulatory status and how to deal with that. I think um, Dirk already uh, alluded in his uh, presentation to that, saying there is this rule of same activities and same risks should face same regulation. And this is what guides also regulators to close this gap. So when there is something that functions like a payment system or a currency or an investment fund, then it should also face the same rules as an investment fund or a payment system. And it cannot just say, oh, we, we set it up in a legally slightly different way, then you have to, to adapt uh, regulation. Of course, the more difficult issue is um, with this bundling of new activities. And there is the um, thing that has wider implications, not only for, for paying or for, for paying. So think of how you measure inflation if you pay by watching um, advertisements or if you pay by uh, disclosing your, your personal data or your, your um, purchase preferences and so on. So, so this has, in a digitalized economy, it has much wider implications than, than just for payment systems. Yeah, I see here um, from Ernest the question about um, the joint regulation. I think you you partly already answered that that question. So I so I think that the intersection of of, of financial activity, payments, say, and um, uh, privacy issues, and how to protect small investors or small um, customers or people with limited um, literacy when it comes to digital uh, tools will be a major issue. I think this has not been a, a super important issue uh, for conventional banking in the past. I might be wrong here. But I think to the extent that we are worried about financial illiteracy in the past or in the present, we will be also very worried about digital illiteracy, if, if I might want to call it like this, in the future. And this uh, might be an, an area of regulation uh, that will be highly dependent on and highly um, uh, interacting in this, this financial regulation. And I think this is, this is going to be key when you think about something like um, Libra initiatives and similar initiatives. And I also see the last question here, which might be maybe closest to what I've said, that technology might be of second order. I agree, but and the, the, the participant asks, but let's face it, the one who is network and technology could incorporate the use of various currencies and eventually CBDCs on the same platform has a huge advantage. And I fully agree. I mean, there's a, there's a huge network benefits when it comes to payment systems and to the adoption of something like a means of payment. And uh, whoever is the first mover there has an advantage. Um, 
many, many countries think about CBDC. Quite a few are starting to do it, many of them very small, but there's also, of course, one very, very big player um, uh, engaging in CBDC. China uh, is, is, is working on that and actually playing with it. And I think what we see in the US now in the last half year or so, where um, the government, Senate and other committees are being pushed by the private sector really to debate this issue much more carefully, is to a large extent also um, being fostered by the worry that China might be, might be issuing a CBDC uh, for widespread use and therefore um, the, um, the exorbitant privilege that the US has been benefiting of for many decades might uh, in the medium term be you know, subject to discussion when the major currency areas like China and maybe later on also the euro area are thinking about issuing CBDCs. So I think this, these, these international relations aspects or these aspects related to the international financial, international financial architecture are, are important you know, aspects in these discussions. Back to Katrin. Yeah, there is another question on research on monetary transmission uh, with a CBDC. I think this is a field that's at the moment um, still very much in flux. There are many um, models around and uh, many different approaches. So uh, either in a more traditional DSGE setting with a banking sector and frictions or in a search setting. I'm also working on a paper, so it will be presented at the uh, ETH Future of Money uh, conference uh, at the end of this week. So it's still all very preliminary, but um, there is a lot of work going on. And um, I think uh, it's safe to say it's not yet mainstream and uh, conclusions vary depending on the setup. But I think in one or two years, um, there will be a lot of more evidence about how it will affect the banking sector and it will affect uh, transition how the euro CBDC is to be secured. I think I said that in the presentation, so it's uh, been envisaged that the reserve will be invested in 80% short-term government bonds, safe government bonds, and 20% into bank reserves, so bank deposits. And um, how would this work out in the crisis? We don't know. The question is whether um, the, the safety of the reserve would be affected. So, if there is a widespread banking crisis and uh, Libra deposits would be at risk, so there would be also a flight from Libra, I would expect. So I, I don't think that it would be making the financial system more stable. With this, thanks again to Katrin and to Dirk for your excellent presentations and the discussion. Thanks to all of you for your questions in the chat. Thanks for Donato for hosting uh, the event, and we all wish you a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ernest, for, for having me, and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye-bye.